welcome to Contact Lost, guys. Uh, tonight, we're, uh, well, I'm going to do something completely new because I want to try, try out a new formula uh, for you guys. And uh, this new segment that I intend to create now is going to be called Late Night Tweak. Uh, and it's called that because it's going to be recorded late at night. And it's probably going to be recorded when my co-host, Joker, uh, is busy putting his little baby girl to sleep. And when my wife and my child are, are also asleep. So in here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover all the bits and bobs that don't really make it into the, our main uh, issue that we uh, release once a week. And uh, I might bring on some guests. Uh, I, I might look at something that, uh, yeah, we simply didn't cover uh, in our uh, main bit that we released. So today, um, I really want to focus on, I want to start with uh, what has been released this week. So an FAQ uh, to Codex Tyranids, uh, and as the main uh, Tyranid player on Contact Lost, uh, I, I reserve the right to, uh, to do that right now for you. So um, you might want to ask yourself a question, is that um, a big FAQ, does it change a lot, etc. The short answer, no, it doesn't change much. Uh, the longer answer, I'll provide right now because I want to go through all those changes and maybe um, explain them and highlight what they actually change. Uh, before I do that, uh, let me know in the comments, let us know in the comments if you like this new formula, if you'd like to see my face, our faces, because this is something completely new. Uh, we have a brand new camera, we have a brand new setup, I'm, I'm getting this whole OBS, oh, sorry, OBS thing uh, to work. This was supposed to be a stream actually, but I had no idea that when you want to go streaming on YouTube you need to ask for permission and this is granted within 24 hours, so when I hit that go live button, instead of going live, it actually put me on hold for 24 hours to make my chat, my, uh, or our um, uh, channel on YouTube eligible. To cast, so this is something that I learned. I, I didn't know that before. Um, so this is pre-recorded, uh, but next time this happens, uh, it's not going to be pre-recorded anymore. Um, so yeah, um, let's first of all leave, leave a message in the comment whether you like this video form. Uh, we have a little surprise coming in for you because on Thursday I visited one of our um, channel's friends, Vitalis, uh, you might have, heard that, might have heard that name before, and we've tried to record a battle report, uh, so I got to play uh, against him and his Imperial Knights, the, the brand new Imperial Knights with the new book, uh, and uh, we'll try to, well we'll, well, we'll see what comes out of it, because um, it was the first time uh, we were recording, new room, new lighting, no microphones, so we were using the camera that I'm using now, and we need to check how it picked up our voices. So it's highly probable that instead of doing like a full-fledged uh, battle report, we'll just do uh, a shorter version, something like I think the guys at Table Play on Tabletop did. So they did something like 40k in 40 minutes, we might want to condense all this and just make it shorter with maybe our commentary. So um, I'll, I'll upload that uh, onto our channel as soon as it's available and then you can see for yourself and you can let us know if this works or not. Uh, so so that's about the future, what's coming. Um, I would like this late night week thing to become a thing as well. So let me know if you, know, if you like that. And now onto the meat of what we wanted to talk about. So uh, the FAQ. Um, the FAQ, I would say, is welcome, and it's not a big surprise. They straightened out a couple of things that uh, were strange in the codex, that people were, were uncertain of, whether there are nurse, probably, whether they are expected, absolutely, well deserved. Uh, I also think that there were a bunch of things that they didn't address, uh, so what, what you, you, you won't find in here are, for example, the mines, and how you use the mines, and how many you can have uh, during a battle. And uh, if you've listened to our episode with Vladi, for example, uh, he, he mentioned that he is already tired of listening to Polish Tyranid players bragging about how they've been using um, uh, biovores 
and harpies to drop, drop bombs on the battlefield and have basically something like 2300 points army because you drop those mines for free um, playing in a game of 2000 points. Um, so I was expecting that. I was expecting that to be uh, somehow tackled. I don't know, maybe in the upcoming data slate or something like that. Uh, and there were a bunch of other things that um, that were not tackled, but I'll get to that in a moment. So starting from the very beginning, we have uh, on page 50, the 55, the Leviathan Psychic Power Hive Nexus. A very strong power. They changed it to now affect core. So if manifested, select one friendly Leviathan core unit within synaptic range of the Psyker, and select one synaptic uh, imperative ability of a friendly Leviathan Synapse model that is also within the synaptic link range of the Psyker. Core units for Leviathan, uh, it is a nerf. It is a nerf because it, it, it's only supposed to target core units, but then when you think of it, the way how Leviathan plays, it's really a, a very small nerf because the, the you you were using it on core units anyway because the, the 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 brunt of your force or the backbone of your army or your list would be warriors uh because they are the biggest beneficiaries of leviathan like uh leviathan's um thing is to boost uh synapse models with uh with transhuman big transhuman and then non synapse models with the small transhuman so in order to 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 get the biggest advantage of Leviathan as a high fleet, you would probably spam warriors anyway, and they are core. So if you want to have like a, a blob of nine warriors, and you want to, for example, keep giving them the uh, um, the Zoanthra uh, imperative to have five plus invulnerable save all the time, you still can do it. So it, it's not a problem. If you want to use the, the Maliceptors um, psychic imperative to allow your warrior unit uh, to do actions after advancing onto an object objective or something like that, you can still do it if you're within synaptic link range. So it's not really a huge nerf for, for Leviathan players, although it might appear as such. But to me, it, it, it's it's an understandable change because you cannot use, abuse that Maliceptor anymore, etc. But you still play with warriors, so essentially uh, not a big deal, I would say. But let me know in the comments if you disagree. Moving on. Uh, power of the Hindmind. This is a nerf, and it's a huge nerf to the Maliceptor especially, because now it, well, it they changed the wording from uh, Select One Hive Tendril Psyker to Select One Hive Tendril Psyker Character. And bear in mind, uh, the Maliceptor is not a character, also, which means that instead of casting three powers, he will now only be able to cast two. And that's, by the way, uh, many people, I think many people believe or believed that it was possible to cast three powers and perform a psychic action. But here in Poland, we play according to the WTC rules. And I think our judges and our tournament organizers here in Poland, basically they've ruled already before this even came out, that you can only cast two powers and then maybe perform a psychic action if you use this. Now, you cannot, so you can only do two things. But does that mean that the Maliceptor is going to drop out of the list? I seriously don't think so. Uh, maybe people will start considering whether it makes sense to bring two, because that's what, what, what started happening also here in Poland, that people started... I think Vladi was the first one to, to bring a list with two Maliceptors, and the Mortal Wound output was, was, was ginormous. It was, like, really a lot. Um, even if you if you use that stratagem only on one of them, uh, it would still spit out a lot of mortal wounds and basically erase your opponent if he or she was within 12 inches of you. Now maybe people will start questioning whether bringing two makes sense, uh, but one is still definitely going to be a staple because whatever he does, you know, with two offensive spells, uh, the the let's say neuroparasite and psychic screen. If they are successful, still casting on three uh, dice thanks to the neuro throat, you are going to get uh, a lot of mortal wounds because three plus three that's six plus potentially d three from psychic screen plus potentially whatever the the the, the amount from from neuro parasite, especially if you're casting that on lower toughness models. So yeah, absolutely, that's still a monster, and you still don't want to face that on the table. Uh, two, maybe an overkill. Time will tell. 
we'll see. Um, so, yeah, definitely an, an, a nerf, but again, an expected nerf, and I think that was uh, a good way of uh, balancing the Mali Scepter without absolutely killing it. We know that GW is um, capable of, of basically erasing a unit from a meta with this. I think it, it puts the Mali Scepter back in its place. Again, time is needed to show whether uh, uh, whether this works or whether, whether the Mali Scepter is still too strong. But to me, it's it looks like a reasonable way to balance the Mali Scepter. Uh, to be honest, in, in my last two games that I played against Knights, so that was against Vitalis, and uh, Chaos Knights against Joker, I the Mali Scepter just sat in the back and did nothing. So even before, the, I mean, it depends on the matchup, it depends on the tables. Again, the WTC ta tables are quite full of terrain, so the Mali Scepter needs to, you know, move around and so on and be susceptible to enemy shooting, and the Knights do shoot in a terrible way. So uh, so I needed to be careful with my Mali Scepter, and I still pulled off two wins in a row against those armies without the Mali Scepter actually doing very much, or maybe doing something in the last turns of the game. Uh, when his participation wasn't that decisive, uh, and I definitely don't see don't see a need to bring two, uh, because the, the codex is just so full of good units that you can bring that two mana setters for me personally is overkill, but I can understand why people want to bring them. Uh, so that's power of the hive mind. Now moving on to the next one, uh, overrun. Uh, overrun, nothing happens here. So if you were wondering what this is about, it took me a, a, a bit to understand what it does. There is no nerf, it, it just changes the wording so that the wording makes sense, because um, it now says if there are no enemy models within an engagement range of that unit, models in that unit can make a normal move, that's it. I think in the codex there was uh, instead of consolidation or something like that. Now it just says it can make a normal move, and that is less questionable, because in the, in the previous form, I think if you met someone that really wasn't like really wanted to make your life difficult, he could say that this word, the, the old wording, uh, is so bad that you actually cannot use this stratagem. I've never met a person who would pro who would say something like that, but I I, I heard Tifus, who is a a, a judge, a, a tournament judge, he said that the wording previously was so bad that if someone wanted to be a dick, they could basically tell you that the strategy cannot work because it's worded in a bad way. So so they changed that so it, for it to sound better, and that's it. That It doesn't nerf anything, it doesn't change anything for, for how the army plays, nothing. So you can still use it pretty much the way you were using it, uh, with, with no changes. Um, next one, we have Encircle the Prey. An expected nerf, seriously. Like if if, if if let's face it, the, the encircle the prey was too powerful. It was um, you basically were allowed to take something off the table at the end of the turn. Um, now you can use it uh, at the end of your movement phase. So it becomes from an abusable stratagem turns into, I would say, a situational strat sorry situational stratagem um, because. Uh, moving something at the end of your movement phase, well, it, it doesn't allow you to be to, to be reckless anymore. It, like, uh, it, it doesn't allow you to just storm into something, fight it, maybe not kill it, but still fuck off <laughs> Sorry, from the table. It doesn't allow you to do that anymore. You need to think now, you need to plan more. Um, I don't think you're just going to go in with a, a high time fly, a fly rent, for example, attack something, not kill it, and then escape unharmed. Uh, it's going to be different now. Um, as I said, very situational. I, I, I don't think you are going to use it on a Hive Tyrant, because the Hive Tyrant need to be actively uh, used all the time, so uh, he's probably not the best target for this stratagem. What you might want to use uh, that on now, but again, bear in mind, situational, might be like uh, Unit of Gargoyles, for example, that, that Hellfly, that you want to take off the table one turn, and then bring them on the table next turn and perform enactment or or, or score engage or something like this. Um, that might be it, or you might wanna, I don't know, I, I thought of it before recording this, you might wanna take a unit of Zoanthros off the table and then 
bring them on in the next phase, uh, sorry, in the next uh, turn, drop it on someone's back, like behind a character that is really annoying and that is sitting in, in the back, and just smite him to death with like a strong smite from the Zoanthropes. Again, fairly similar and sounds like a very suicidal mission for the Zoanthropes, although they are um, very resilient with, uh, you know, four wounds and, and four invulnerable, invulnerable save. Um, but yeah, as I said, situational. So uh, I wouldn't really build my strategy around it. Just if you see an opportunity and you want to use it and you know that it won't backfire, you might want to use it then. But let's face it, it was an expected change. Uh, spore nodes. Uh, if that action is successfully completed, place one objective marker anywhere within one inch of the unit that completed this action. I don't really use spore nodes. I don't even know what this does. Uh, but I don't think it's game breaking or game changing for us. The next one, however, uh, did have a lot of response within the Polish community. So, uh, Synapse becomes an aura. Um, this means that Synapse can now be denied, because or denied, well, shut down, because there are armies in uh, in the game that can shut down auras or like decrease the area that auras uh, affect. Um, is there anything to be worried about? Potentially in certain matchups. I know that Death Guard probably have an ability like that, and maybe Chaos Knights. If there is anything else, let me know, because those are the, the two that, that immediately come to, my, to, to mind. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, I, I really don't think it matters that much, or, or that it changes a lot. Again, um, the, most of your signups unit, uh, units are single units, apart from uh, Zoanthropes, and apart from Warriors. With Warriors, if you get the entire unit of warriors within the range of an ability that turns turns off their signups, then maybe perhaps you could start failing your leadership tests or something like this. But other than that, it doesn't really change that much. So I wouldn't be worried. Again, I might be mistaken. So so if you have other thoughts about it, do drop those thoughts in the comment. I'm happy to have a discussion. Happy to hear your thoughts and and, and, and to to be corrected. So, uh, by all means, do let me know if I'm wrong. Um, uh, next one, High Tyrant War Gear Options. Uh, they just clarify that the High Tyrant can take one Heavy Venom Cannon. Seriously, if you were playing with two, I think you were abusing the, uh, the wording of the book. I have my High Tyrant in the back uh, sitting with just a single Heavy Venom Cannon. I don't really, I, I, I never, it never really crossed my mind to use two, uh, so no change for me. Uh, but if someone, you know, modeled theirs to have two, that won't affect them, obviously. But I think, again, it's an expected change because a, a character having two strength nine, AP three, or even four, I can't remember, because I used the shard gullet, which is AP five, but uh, it has only three shots. But then you're having two, Heavy Venom Cannons, Strength 9, AP 3, Damage 4, uh, so 6 shots with Ballistic Skill of 2+, plus on a body that can move, you know, uh, 9 inches, or even 16 inches, or 17 inches with other normal glands on, on the fly rent. Insane. I, I, you can figure out on your own that it wasn't meant to be, it wasn't supposed to be like that. So um, they, they just clarified that. And the same goes for the next one, which is about Zoanthropes getting the signups keyword. Again, they have their imperative, so it was kind of obvious that they should have the signups uh, keyword. Although, the Malice Scepter doesn't have the signups keyword, so uh, maybe not. But I think they have always had a signups keyword, and they just brought it back now. So, uh, again, no big surprise there. Uh, next, the change of the Tyrannocytes battlefield role. Uh, to dedicated transport, which absolutely makes sense and should have been there from the very beginning, so they are just correcting uh, a mistake that they did. And then abilities aerial seeding change the second sentence to read the transport model can be set up in reinforcement step of your first, second, or third movement phase, regardless of any mission rules anywhere on the battlefield. That ear, <laughs> so there, there, there is a typo, that is 
more than nine inches away from enemy models, and that's it. Um, then there is a glossary entry for adaptive physiologies, a unique upgrade that can be given to high tendril monster models, excluding character and titanic models, and uh, the FAQs, which again clarify what I discussed uh, previously. So if a Maliceptor model has uh, the enraged reserves adaptive physiologies, is it considered to have doubled the number of wounds? No. And that's how we've been playing it in Poland as well. Enraged reserves did not make you cast or sorry, inflict three mortal wounds still, if you were, like, uh, bracketed with the Malice Scepter. Uh, we just assumed, here in Poland, that this is how you should play it. Uh, so so nobody really took Enraged Reserves on the Malice Scepters. Um, but apparently, it was a question that people had, and it was something that people used in the past, so so they clarified that. That's, that's a very good clarification. And uh, the second question, uh, the Psychic Oversight Synaptic Imperative allows units performing a Psychic Action to still manifest Psychic Powers. If a unit performs a Psychic Action, does it count as one of the Psychic Powers that a unit is allowed to manifest that turn? The answer is yes. So performing a Psychic Action is treated the same as if attempting uh, to manifest a Psychic Power. And so counts against the number of Psychic Powers that the model can use, which means that the Maliceptor can either cast two powers or a power and his psychic action, which again makes sense as, as, uh, and as I explained. It is a nerf to him because he can only cast two instead of three, but he can he definitely can cast three or, or, or four like people used to do in the past. So again, good clarification. And that's basically it. That's the, that's the FAQ. Does it break the army? No. Does it change a lot to the, to the way the army plays? No. Is it expected? Absolutely, yes. And uh, I think more is coming uh, probably in the data slate because there are still things in this army that are overpowered. You can see by the results from the tournaments uh, that are happening. Uh, today is, well, now it's Monday, but later today you will get probably the uh, Meta Watch or whatever it's called, the Monday Meta thing on Reddit and I'm sure there are going to be turnings all over the place. So yeah, I think this was necessary and, and, and you'll see more nerves in the data slate. I think the things that are they are going to see nerves are uh, the spore mines, probably the way they work uh, and how you can abuse them. The harpy because it's just underpriced. Um, maybe some price hikes on things like pyrovores because 30 points uh, a model in that case is fairly low and i would probably also expect to see uh, the price of the warriors go up because you can spam them recklessly in for example in leviathan and uh, with the weapons being for free and so on a unit of three costs just 75 points and you get a unit of nine wounds save four with the potential for invulnerable saves with transhuman um, and all their weapons are for free apart from venom cannons so that's i mean that's great for tyrannids but it's not really great for 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 our enemies uh so yeah that's basically it as i said i i had an opportunity to play my tyrannids against uh imperial knights and chaos knights uh if you're interested um in what or in how the, the chaos knights play and what's strong or weak about them we just did an episode on um uh, Chaos Knights with Vladi and Duda. Uh, Joker interviewed them and also contributed because he he's also a Chaos Knight player. Uh, so give that a listen uh, because it's a really good and interesting episode uh, and it's still fairly fresh. From my perspective, uh, Chaos Knights seem stronger than uh, Imperial Knights. They have more uh, interesting gimmicks and useful powers and the, 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 the whole dread thing with uh, cutting your, if, if you don't pass your leadership test, they cut your um, uh, charge range, uh, and uh, I think you, have, you, you, you don't hit that well or something like that. They debuff you uh, in a very specific way, which might be dangerous, and you need to um, take that into account when planning what you want to do. They have a, a secondary objective that I think will be played in every game, that you score points for having objectives within your dread range, which is fantastic. 
so they are a really interesting army and a really strong army, but not overpowered. It's, they they are uh, very well balanced uh, within the book. Um, Imperial Knights didn't impress me that much. Uh, maybe it was also because Vitalis had horrible roles. Uh, I'm spoiling spoiling the, the the battle report a little bit, but but yeah, but he had horrible roles. Uh, he played a Castellan. Uh, because the Castellan apparently can have a combo in which he does like 20 mortal wounds with his uh, with his cannon or whatever weapon he has. But yeah, the, the, the major problem with both Chaos Knights and Imperial Knights is uh, that they've cut their movement. So the big knights, Castellans, or Tyrants I think are the equivalent, uh, move 8 inches and the Helverines or the Armigers uh, dropped from 14 to 12. We in Poland play on WTC terrain, which means very dense tables with a lot of terrain, a lot of forests, a lot of ruins, uh, which renders the um, Imperial Knights even slower. So when I played against uh, Joker, he basically moved his two knights to the front uh, through the two openings that he had between like ruins and containers and so on, and then his army guards couldn't really move well, uh, so he wasted a turn just adjusting the movement so that he could get pathways for his army guards to move around the, the terrain. So that's something that you really need to take into consideration when you're playing them. With Vitalis, it was almost the same. I mean, knights, first of all, are very hard to, to hide, so, so he had a problem because they had a very shooty army. Um, let me know if you want to find out what my list is, because I have a very nice anti-knight list. Uh, in Behemoth. So if anyone's interested, uh, we can have an, a separate episode about that. But uh, in that game, uh, I started, I shot a lot. Uh, Vitalis didn't really have uh, the, 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 the saving power to protect himself, plus the terrain was or played to his disadvantage, and there was even a turn in which his Castellan, a 600-point monster, didn't shoot because I was hidden behind the terrain he couldn't move far enough because of his limited movement, because like maneuvering between uh, uh, pieces of terrain. So, yeah, it, it posed a difficulty. And another thing is, even though Joker played the, the house that gave him additional wounds, so he had like 30 wounds or 28 wounds on his, uh, I think, 30 wounds. I can't remember, but like a lot of wounds, I guess you get, you get like plus four wounds. So he had very resilient, very durable knights. And Vitalis had also, he took the house with like more wounds, which meant his knights were also more durable and more resilient. I understand that they, they were playing with new books, but they played very defensively. So they like protected their knights, they wanted to hide them behind terrain. What that meant that when the game started and they started movement, they needed to walk around that terrain to even be able to see me. And for the majority of the game, they didn't play the objective game. So primary objective game, because they just couldn't get to objectives. Um, and when they did, I was already there with my behemoth uh, um, uh, and lurk. So objective secured units, and uh, it was difficult for the knights to fight for, for the objectives. So yeah, th 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 those are my first impressions. Uh, I know that Joker is a great player. I know that Vitalis is a great, great, great player. They already have new lists on mine, and we're going to play the shit out of those books and out of those models. Uh, and hopefully, we are going to create more battle reports for you to see uh, on the channel. Uh, Definitely, when 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 Vitalis is done with um, editing the, the the battle report that we recorded, we're going to upload it to this channel as well. Um, and yeah, and I'm really keen to to hear whether you're interested in videos like this one. Uh, as I mentioned, the 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 late night tweak uh, segment, hopefully, sorry, come come next week is going to be a live thing. Um, for now, it needed to be recorded. I hope it was informative. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, let me know if there is anything that I should adjust, tweak, make better, uh, or just talk a little bit less because I tend to speak a lot. So uh, yeah, your input is much appreciated. And uh, we're recording the next episode on Tuesday, so I reckon it will be released on Wednesday. And if everything goes fine, we'll have Pumbaa 
and Asarnio on to talk about how the data slate affected the power armor armies and whether they were a force to be reckoned with or the changes didn't really mean that much. So hopefully uh, you'll hear us then. So probably Tuesday or on Wednesday. And with that, I thank you for your attention and until next time. Thanks guys.